Hello and welcome along to the Property Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And today, Andrew, is it getting hot? Yes, it is, because we're talking about fire. That is Financial Independence Retire Early. So the acronym for that is FIRE. And we're going to talk about what this is, what the strategies are to do it, and then who it's right and who it's wrong for. So just walk us through, Andrew, what is FIRE? So as Ed just mentioned, uh, it stands for Financial Independence Retire Early, and it's uh, often called a movement because no one person or business specifically leads it, um, but I've seen it um, bandied about by a lot of financial planners. I think Hannah McQueen used it a bit. Uh, I can't remember who else. Uh, very popular on, on the Reddit, uh, and, and uh, very common amongst millennials. So uh, yeah. Yes, Ed, I am a millennial again. Mine and Ed's age and You're younger. not a millennial if you call it the Reddit. <laughs> I only do that for the fans. Um, and and the whole concept of it, the, the idea behind it is um, instead of working for 40 years and then retiring um, naked, uh, then then you basically you save, you save as hard as you can and you keep your expenses as low as possible and you just cut back on work earlier. So, so you might work, you may get yourself down to working three or two days a week and um, your financial independence is, is actually being structured so that you're not needing to work to fulfill your basic needs. Now, just to be clear, your basic needs aren't cigars, uh, expensive bottles of wine, dinner out all the time and over, luscious, luxurious overseas holidays. It's your basic needs. But this then gives you the freedom to decide when you want, whether or not you want to retire early or, or wind back and, and, and can actually just spend time living rather than, rather than just working. The whole idea is that it frees you up not to worry about uncertain or, or be uncertain about money. And it's important to as well that it's not just a, a, a fluffy idea. There are some real strategies within this specific movement uh, that I want to walk through. And I suppose this episode or the next two are really about dealing with money and personal finance and the way that that flows into property. So the classic strategy for achieving FIRE is to build up a base level of assets and then use the rule of 4%. And the rule of 4% is, is very simple. It says, look, if you've got a base level of debt-free assets, then you can usually take out 4% of those and live per annum and not deplete the initial base of assets. So let's say that there's a uh, 100k income is what you want to live on. And if you've got $2.5 million of assets, then 4% of that per year, that's your 100k. So effectively, you could have that passive income for life. Now, the way that they do this, uh, the classic strategy in FIRE is to use uh, low cost index funds and sell off some of your uh, funds, shares, uh, every year in order to be able to do that. I mean, here, obviously, we, we've talked about the rule of 4%, which we think is probably the right number. We've talked about doing it using rental properties in the past, which we just talked about at our recent webinar. Um, and the way that you build up that level of assets to then achieve that 4% uh, is they reckon that saving up 50% of your income is the classic FIRE strategy. So of every dollar you earn after tax, saving 50% of that. And uh, I think at that point, you, there are going to be some people listening to the show saying, how does anybody save 50% of their income? Which is a fair criticism, which we'll talk about later as well. But that's the classic way. Of course, you could do whatever you want in order to be able to build up that level of assets, but that's the classic strategy. Now, my question for you, Andrew, is you know, what are some of the other ways people are able to build up to achieve that financial independence so you've got that large asset base. So the big focus is on on working and then having a side hustle as well. So so you might have a, a part time job as a barista, for example, uh, earn some income, and, and then and then start up a, a, a side business where you um, you're a photographer at the weekend and you do you do some photography f uh, for things. You might um, sell some of those photos through one of the websites online where you can you can do that independent contracting, all of those kind of things. Uh, you might do some DJing work at the weekend, but 
also generate all the, all the all the things that Ed and I would be terrible at because we're not creative like like all the people that work within the company uh, that do those kind of things. So um, it's about generating these these extra levels of income, um, and and often um, you know the best way to do that is having a, a passive income. So I, this kind of makes me think back to um, Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week, which is one of my favourites. If you haven't read it, we'll listen to it on audio audible uh, where he talks about having um you know, businesses where uh, I think his business started with supplements or something like that, and so he he uh, created a way where they could automate most of the process and and have people in the Philippines answering questions and and generate an income so that he could uh, live live a basically retired life, which was just financial independence. And digging down a little more into some of the principles of fire, uh, so to give you some references to think about as you're walking around the supermarket and thinking about financial independence. Um, One of the big themes for them is around a conscious decision of where your money goes. It's not necessarily about living in squalor. That's not what it's about. But they often talk about hours of life energy. So when you're thinking about going and making a purchase, tying it directly back to the number of hours you have to work. And that's why they call it hours of life energy. So let me give you an example about this. To, to try and help make your spending a bit more conscious. Let's say you earn 100k a year. Nice round number, pretty good income. So after tax, that's 75k a year. Now that's about $36 an hour after tax, assuming a 40-hour work week. So every hour you work, roughly $36. Now if you want to go buy a $200 pair of shoes, that's going to take you 5.55 hours, so five and a half hours worth of what they would call life energy. And what this movement often tries to encourage people to do is to think, well, is that worth, is that pair of shoes worth five and a half hours worth of my life energy? And if the answer is yes, then sweet, go ahead and buy it because that's genuinely going to make you happy. But if it's not, and you think, well, do you know what? Maybe maybe they're not actually worth that. Maybe you don't really need them. Then that helps to give you a frame of reference for whether you really want something or not. And I think it's quite interesting because if you think about, I don't know, some of the things that you, other crap that you buy, actually, no, I don't want to tell <laughs> that because I actually want that. No, no, tell it. And actually, I'll give you an example of something that I think is absolutely worth my life energy at the moment. So I've been telling <laughs> Kelly that I really want to buy one of those um uh, it's a it's a ping pong machine. So it's a table tennis thing that fires ping pong balls at you, so you can hit them back if you're in lockdown. Oh, our own Forrest Gump. And you're, you're, no, because he played up against a um a, 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 a uh, what do you call it? A wall. A which, wall. Which I can do at home on my <laughs> table tennis table. But the, the issue then is you don't know when you hit the table tennis ball. You don't know whether it goes in or not. And so I want a little machine. <laughs> That, that fires them out at me. Now, I think this is going to cost me somewhere between $400 and $600. But I just think about it. I think, God, that's worth some of my life energy because, boy, that would make me happy. Now, from a fire perspective, they would say, oh, that's, that's a great purchase because it's worth however many hours worth of life energy. And you think, God, that's probably quite worthwhile. But if you're the sort of person who uh, isn't into playing table tennis by yourself, you probably would say, well, that's not worth my life energy. Uh, and so that's a wee frame of reference as well. <laughs> Didn't expect to share that story, but here we go. And I, do you know, I, know, I think I know you probably yeah. better than most people, and I had no idea that you played table tennis, let alone by yourself. But I am oh, slightly I concerned I, about how many, how much work energy this is going to take away. <laughs> well, just tell us as well, Andrew. You know, this is a property podcast, and here we are talking about personal finance. Just walk us through how this is related directly through to property and the things we talk about on the show. Well, look, I guess a lot of uh, what we talk about in the show, whilst it be about property, it is about this financial independence. And, and you know, we use different words for it, retirement, financial independence, you know, whatever. Uh, just just doing whatever the hell you want, income. basically, at the weekend. Uh, yeah, passive income. Uh, and and so we, we just choose to use property as, a, as the, the, the mechanism to get you there and uh, rather than something like these index funds and sa- saving and buying index funds but we use property as the mechanism to get you there rather than say index funds because um, property is more reliant on the equity in your house than cash flow uh, generally speaking um, but there's nothing to stop someone listening to this 
with doing both. Uh, you know, buy investment properties if you've got equity in your in your uh, own house. Uh, park those to the side and, and save as much as you can. Save uh, as long and as hard as you possibly can um, while while working out how you're g- going to structure your life so that you are just spending spending on what the needs are that make you happy and not spending excessively just because it's on sale twenty five percent this week at, at um, whatever store that appears on my credit card. And it's important to know as well, we're, we're going to take this a bit further in tomorrow's episode and talk more about lifestyle inflation as well. So hang out for that one. But what I also want to do is talk about some of the criticisms that s- some people have um, of fire. And obviously, one of the big ones uh, that I've seen is that it's only for finance bros, which was actually a bit of a new term for me. So I'm, I, What's finance I, I, I bros? I sometimes wonder whether... Well, it's meant to be the, the sorts of, of bro guys... You know, who, who got a bit of bravado and a bit mask and into talking about finance. So, you know, in some mask? ways, Andrew, I kind of wish we were finance pros. <laughs> uh, uh, um, <laughs> what do you mean? Do you know what mask means, don't you? Uh, no do you idea. you know what mask means? Masculine. No. Masculine. Oh, masculine. masculine. Why don't you just say masculine? Then? Why, masculine. why do the kids Mas- these days just have to cut half a word mask. off? Yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> Leave that in, David. Andrew Nichols' grumpy grandpa <laughs> moment. <laughs> but there are some, um, you know, criticisms like, well, it only works for singles or it only works for people on high incomes. And look, some of that's fair. Obviously, it is much easier if you are going to save half your income. Obviously, it's so much easier if you're single, you're not financially supporting anybody else, you don't have any kids. <laughs> you know, that actually genuinely is going to be much easier. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't stop with a lower amount, start with a lower amount uh, and then build up the amount of savings over time, uh, potentially as you start to earn more over time. And I think one of the other criticisms sometimes of this movement is that if you say start in your 20s and you achieve that financial independence because you've got a very low, uh, a very cheap lifestyle, you know, you haven't got a whole heap of stuff, then uh, the expenses you've got in your 20s may not actually be a good baseline for what your expenditure might be later on in life, um, which I think is you know potentially fair as well. But I do think that you can take the principles and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So while some people will approach this idea and keep their expenses very low, move to Bali, start an online blog or something like that, and do the kind of classic what we think of millennial nomad thing, you know, sitting with their laptops on a beach. You can still take these principles and uh, apply them in a way that works better for you. And, I mean, it doesn't even mean that you've got to give up your job and actually want to retire early. I mean, how does all of this sit with you, Andrew? Because I I mean, I hope that you're not going to retire early. Uh, look, I, I can tell you this much. I, I, I completely want financial independence. That that's a really important thing for me. Uh, that's that's why I invest and and um, you know save uh, save money as well. Um, but I don't want to retire early. I love my job. It's 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 fun. Uh, it's my hobby as well. And, and so I want to have options. But I also not looking to stop anytime soon because you know I want to just build my wealth and and, and create that for future generations. And, and I do think you know. Some of the stuff feels a little eerie for me, eerie fairy for me, and that might just be my grumpy old man coming out because because I hear about like the, like it says the bloggers sitting in Bali. I think they're going to need to get a job sooner or later because eventually eventually the market's not going to work in their favour, and then they'll have to go and come back and and work for me hopefully, um and 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 start investing in property. But you know I I think all of this is great, and and certainly I think the best part is assessing whether or not. You you're going to get actually the value out because we do buy things just too frivolously some of the times, but you don't want to live through, you know, life's too short not to live it. You don't want to go through life, uh, pinching every penny if you're thinking about that then you just need to start to think about those side hustles start to earn more and start investing because uh, otherwise the reason that this appeals to singles is because if you go Dutch on the first date you'll always be single <laughs> I also remember Andrew reading <laughs> or watching a documentary why are you laughing because I thought you were going to tell me that you went was- Dutch on the first date with Kelly or something <laughs> No, I most certainly did not. In fact, she's told me many times that that was the true test. If I made her pay for it for half of the first date, she was going to get rid of me straight away. So, um, 
So I just didn't take you somewhere nice. So then basically it was the same <laughs> price as if I made a goat Dutch and take it somewhere nice. No, I, I'm not that cheap, people. Now, look, if you want to learn more about this as well, then there are a couple of places to learn. Uh, they've got a very uh, popular Reddit. You'll be able to find that. Just Google Reddit Finance, uh, Financial Independence, Retire Early. Well, the, the classic book that kicked this all off was Your Money or Your Life, which was written in 1992 by a lady called Vicky Robin. Now, the book itself is a bit hippie for me in terms of, you know, the sitting on the beach in Bali and things. But I do think even people who are very ambitious and who like their jobs and want to progress up the ranks and, you know, achieve something within their corporate life, I still think these principles are useful. So don't throw the baby out of the uh, with the bathwater because I think we all want to achieve some level of financial independence where we go to work because we like it and we choose to and we like what we do. But actually, if we needed to quit, in four weeks' time would be able to do so if we needed to. And I think that's really cool. Now, we're going to continue this in tomorrow's episode where we talk about lifestyle inflation, which is, uh, I suppose, another key concept that I want to layer on top of this. But the main things to take away today, I think, is thinking about you know, how much are you saving per week? How much of your income can you save? And then the other side as well. And I think uh, the hours of life energy is a really good frame of reference when you're thinking about making a purchase. Hey, look, let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, if you want to learn more about property, head over to our YouTube channel because we're just releasing now a new series about the interest deductibility tax changes. We've got a series of six videos. We're releasing one a week every Wednesday at 10 a.m. And it's great because then you can both hear the explanation, but also see some of those concepts as well, because uh, we've got some great slides that animate across the screen. Now, if you want to watch those, tap or swipe over the cover art. There'll be a link in there. Or just Google Opus Partners YouTube and make sure you hit that subscribe button so that uh, it's always popping up for you. <laughs>